Hey everyone, welcome to episode 18 with Chris Frith, widely regarded as one of the most influential neuroscientists of the modern era. Earlier this year, Chris and his wife Uta Frith, another pioneer in the field, released a fantastic book called Two Heads, where two neuroscientists explore how our brains work with other brains. If you enjoyed the show, please hit subscribe below as it really, really helps this channel to grow. Thanks for watching. Chris, thanks so much for speaking today and having me over here to your, your beautiful house. Pleasure. So Chris, the, the first thing I wanted to ask is before we get into your story, do you think you'd best characterize yourself as a psychologist or a neuroscientist or a neuropsychologist? I think I probably think of myself as a neuropsychologist. So as a neuroscientist, I feel a bit of an imposter. Um, but I have... I certainly started off doing experimental psychology and then became increasingly interested in the brain. So I'm, in a sense, my main interest is how there's the interaction or the connection between the brain and the mind. So I guess that's neuropsychology. And because I happened to get into brain imaging really right from the start, I that's when I became sort of moved into being called a cognitive neuroscientist. But I don't really know enough about the brain or physiology to justify that. So neuropsychology, that's yeah. what we'll go for. Okay, great. So we'll go back to kind of the, the start of your school story. Um, what were you like as school? What were you interested in? How would you describe yourself? I was... Well, I was probably mainly interested in music, which was ran in the family um so i was actually you know leader of the orchestra and the string quartet but what i was good at mainly was maths i mean i quite like english but i didn't like the english teacher but the maths i could <laughs> i was quite good at and it was always appealed to me because there was a right answer so i finished up having done I mean in those days of course when you got to 16 you had to specialize so I did maths physics and chemistry and almost nothing else no history or geography or anything like that but I though I had because in those in those ancient days I had done Latin and Greek which was slightly surprising because you, you still had to do a Latin exam to get into Cambridge to read natural sciences. I think it was the last year that that happened. Were you interested in people's behaviour at that age at all, or were you just much more into your maths and, and other things? Um, I, I, well, when I was certainly when I was younger, um, before getting into the maths so much, I was very interested in nature and watching birds and animals and seeing what they did so there was always that background but i finished up as i say i was intending to read natural sciences but oh so my chemistry was no good at all so that they very much moved me into the physics and math side of things but before i went up a, a friend a very nice chap who was a friend of my father's who was a biology teacher I think told me about this new thing called cybernetics which is basically maths applied to the behavior of systems and control systems and I, I thought that sounded extremely interesting and much more interesting than physics so so I arrived in Cambridge I did my maths and physics and then I discovered that for the first time they were going to introduce psychology as a part one, as they have it in that place. So I went to my tutor, and, who was a physicist, and I said, I've discovered that I can do psychology the next year as a half subject, as they called it. And he said, yes, I knew that, but I didn't think any of my pupils would be cross enough to want to do that. <laughs> so, of course, I did it. And then specialised in for the final year, and that was the, in the great days of where behaviourism was turning into cognitive psychology, and I was lectured by 
broad um, Broadbent and Richard Gregory on the cognitive side. My tutor was a hardline Skinnerian, and also Larry Weisskrantz and Alan Cowie were still in Cambridge. So I had a very good background for neuropsychology and cognitive psychology. Do you think if you hadn't made the switch into psychology, you could have imagined yourself doing a particular natural science or other discipline? Well, I suppose so. But as I say, I was I, when I arrived in Cambridge, I discovered that my musicianship was not as good as I thought. <laughs> they were much, much better than me there. Um, but the, the, what everybody does who plays the violin and finds they're not very good is you switch to the viola because they're always, the orchestras always need viola players. So that's what I did, and I played the viola for many years. I mean, after, you know, my 20s and 30s, and even once or twice got paid. So I'm wondering if I hadn't gone into psychology, would I have gone into music? I don't know. I mean, it's just remotely possible. And the other thing, of course, is when I left Cambridge, I actually had an interview with the BBC to become a trainee film editor, which was another, of course, everybody was interested in films in those days, but that didn't come off. So I can see all sorts of alternatives. Can you say a bit more about, um, you know, what interested you about cybernetics? I've heard that you're a bit of a science fiction fan. So was there some connection there with the kind of technology and computer? Well, that's, yes, that's interesting. I'm so, yes, um but I don't, does cybernetics relate to that? I mean, certainly I was, I'm a very great fan of um, Stanislas Lem, who's this Polish science fiction writer who was certainly into cybernetics and control systems and communication and all that sort of thing. But I'm not, I mean, the, the, the science fiction that most interested me, of course, in, those, in the 60s was J.G. Ballard and Philip K. Dick. And... Um, the big thing, there was something called New World, which was a magazine where these people published, and their big thing was to say, we are exploring inner space, not outer space. So I guess that my career has certainly been concerned with exploring inner space and saying how much more difficult this is than understanding the universe, and Brian Cox has got it completely wrong. The mystery is not how the universe began, but how the consciousness emerges from the brain, or And um, so, you, and you did a PhD in experimental psychology at London's Institute of Psychiatry. Can yeah. you say a little bit about that and what that involved? Well, yes, that was. I mean, I, I, when I left Cambridge, I only had a two two, and I had planned to go and do a PhD with Donald Mackay, who was one of the first. Who was one of the first people to apply computing system ideas to psychology and behaviour, but of course I didn't have a good enough degree, so I went and did clinical psychology instead as a way back into a PhD, which did actually work. So that's why I finished up doing a PhD at the Institute of Psychiatry after my diploma in abnormal psychology. And that was very lucky. I mean, for various reasons. First of all, I became interested in abnormal psychology, and in particular in schizophrenia, which is where my early work mostly took place, which we can go back to because that fits in with Philip K. Dick. But the um, the other thing about the Institute of Psychiatry was extremely advanced in terms of methodology. So we got we got one of the first we were one of the first psychology departments to have a computer, which was a Link Eight which I learned to operate, and which we got in 1965. So I spent a lot of my PhD learning how to write programs and using the computer to do tasks that couldn't have been done before. So my PhD was partly about learning motor skills. And there was a device called a pursuit rotor, which in those days was very widely used <clears throat> and it basically consisted of a gramophone turntable with a metal disc on one side so the metal disc went round and round and round <clears throat> and you had a stylus 
with a metal end, which you had to try and keep on this metal disc, which is actually much more difficult than it sounds. And you could measure, because if the stylus was touching the metal disc, it made contact, so you could measure how much of the time you were actually on target. So you got a very crude measure of um, your skill. And as I say, this is a strangely difficult task that you learn very, very slowly. So in the course of about 15 minutes, your performance will get better and better. And then strange things happen after rests and so on, which we needn't go into. But with a computer, I could make a pursuit rotor, which was much more sophisticated because you had a target on the screen. And instead of making it go round and round, you could make it go in any path you liked. And actually, I learned how to do Fourier transforms and things like that, so I can make it the path be a sum of several sine wave frequencies, all ran and you could make it essentially random or learnable, and then you could look at how performance um, related, how much advantage people could take of predictable movements of the target over time. So that was all very exciting to be in there right at the start. Um, but I also, because my supervisor had a thing called a handbook of abnormal psychology, which he had to revise, and there was a chapter on schizophrenia, and he assigned me to do the chapter on schizophrenia. So I became very expert on the sort of cognitive aspects of schizophrenia. And then this wonderful chance came up where I was able to move to a medical research council unit specialised in studying schizophrenia. Um, with my even better computer, which is now PDP-11, <laughs> which I think is now in the Science Museum, is that not? And um, my career sort of took off from there. You didn't stay in say, clinical psychology, obviously you, you moved over. Um, yeah. Was that a difficult decision or were you... No, no, yeah, no, no. I mean, I, quite, I mean, it was very strange days then because it was the beginning of behaviour therapy. And one of the stud, one of the clinical tasks I had was to deal with a chap from the BBC who wanted to go down the submarine but stuff, suffered from claustrophobia. So he wanted to be treated. And in those days there was something called flooding. So basically I locked him in a small dark room. <laughs> I'm not sure if people still do this sort of thing. <laughs> today but at the end of the course which was fine they basically said to me we think you should go into research and not see patients <laughs> so I didn't have to make any decisions and I was very happy with that suggestion that's a, that's a great story um, and, and you worked at a few different asylums in South London oh yes that was that was that. that's interesting so in the beginning before I went to the Maudsley which is the Institute of Psychiatry I was started doing a course in house on the in what do you call it i mean in real practice as it were and that certainly at that time that was in south london so i went to places like cane hill and saw patients there but later when i was with the mrc we spent a great deal of our time at shenley hospital which is actually north so there's actually there's a ring of Asylums, as they used to be called, round London, because they took the, where they wanted the people to be in the countryside where it's healthy. And I can't. And there was Benstead, Cane Hill, um, Shenley Hospital, and some others that I can't at this moment remember. But if you look at the map, you can see they're in a ring round London. And when I was visiting Shenley, it was it had. It had various patients, but 1,000 of the patients there had a diagnosis of schizophrenia, I think it was. And when we checked this, we thought that about 700 of them really did. <clears throat> and it was very interesting going there and meeting these people. And then, of course, a short, not a few years later, they were all closed down, which was partly to make money because the land was sold and is now full of posh flats. And partly because people believed in things like institution, where institutionalization, where they thought putting patients in these places was bad for them. 
And I think that's true for some patients, but for other patients, it was really the only way they could get by. And you now have care in the community, which, because, of course, no money is spent on it, is pretty much a disaster for the sorts of patients I was seeing. And many of them are now in prison. This, this is my story, at least, yeah. Well, you said that you were told you'd be better suited for research than seeing patients, but why, why exactly? Because you didn't possess the, the, the interest for it, or...? Well, yes, what I mean, I can arrogantly say that I find it difficult to say to someone, you're ill, I know what's wrong with you, and I can do something about it. Because I'm, I mean, it's almost like the scientist in me is saying, I have no idea what's wrong with you, and I don't know what to do about it, but I'm determined to try and find out, sort of thing. But this is not a good way to treat people. Hmm. Okay, I see, I see. Um, so, so afterwards, you moved. I believe you moved to Hammersmith Hospital. So I was at the MRC for a wonderful time, where we I developed theories of schizophrenia. I learned more about computing, and in particular, I learned all about the brain, because the wonderful thing about being in that unit was that all possible disciplines were represented. So, just going back a bit, when I was at the Maudsley Hospital, we had a floor in the new building and on one corridor was the clinical psychologist and the other corridor was the experimental psychologist who had rather little to do with them. And when I spoke to my supervisor and said it would be, I think it would be very interesting to talk to some physiologists about this and he said no, no, don't bother, they won't help at all. So, I mean, and departments are still somewhat insular in this way. But with the MRC, as I said, we had, you know, a psychologist, me and two assistants. We had anatomists, we had biochemists who turned into molecular biologists, we had psychiatrists, we had people studying animals, and for briefly we even had a sociologist. So that, and we all had coffee together. And I say that's where I learned about all sorts of things, part, a little bit about sociology, but quite a lot about the brain, which I hadn't really known before. And suddenly realising that when you're studying psychology, you're really finding out how the brain works. But for complicated political reasons, they decided to close down that unit. And that's why I moved to the Hammersmith. But already at the end of that time, we had started doing brain scanning. We did the very first CAT scans, as they were called, which are just structural, looking at patients with schizophrenia. And we also did some there's a thing called a gamma camera, the early stuff where you inject people like me with radiation and look at the brain and see where it goes. So we had, and we were collaborating with the Hammersmith on doing PET scans. So that seemed, and it was very easy for the MRC to move me from one unit to this other unit. So that's mainly a sort of accident, but that meant that I was at the Hammersmith. We had the very first PET scanning unit in the country, not in the world. And then a few years later, we moved to Institute of Neurology to set up a MRI scanning unit. So that was all very exciting because you could, because nobody else could do it, you could almost anything you did with the scanner, you could get published. And you could do all the easy stuff. Um, so that was quite fun. I remember, I mean, I wasn't involved, but one of the first studies that was published, which was Semir Zeki, who previously worked with monkeys looking at the colour centre in the brain of people. And um, I think the study had four subjects in it, which is extraordinarily low, but typical of physiology. So those were very exciting times. And um, one of the interesting things about doing brain scanning is that in a sense you can study imagination, consciousness, because you can do things like, what happens when you imagine moving your arm? <laughs> Which is difficult to do without a scanner. And you can put people in the scanner and say, imagine moving your arm. And you lo and behold, areas of the brain concerned with arm movements light up, as we say. Or later on, I didn't do this, but you can ask people to imagine a house or imagine a face. And again, you can see the, the house area and the face area lighting up. 
as they do this. So that, I mean, th these were new things that were completely impossible previously. And in relation to schizophrenia, obviously what you could do is you could scan, which we did, was to scan people while they were hallucinating. So they actually had to press a button when the hallucination started because there were still people out there who said they're just making it up. They're not really hearing voices and you could actually see bit, the relevant bits of the brain becoming active during the hallucination. Was that exciting? Being so that was, that was all very exciting, yeah. I mean, mm. it sort of, in a sense, fizzled out because of having done all that early stuff, we still didn't know why they were having the hallucination. <laughs> Since then, I mean, you've done, a, you've done a lot in your career. What would you point to to say have been some of the, the greatest things you think you've worked on and uh, accomplished? Well, yes, I think with the brain imaging, what we just discussed is using it to study these more abstract things like imagination um, and also we did quite a lot of stuff on what we used to call free will, so what happens when people make their own decision what they're going to do rather than being told by the experimenter as is usually the case and you could show that the frontal lobe becomes active as soon as you have to do these self-initiated type movements and that led me to think a great deal about free will and to think these experiments were actually a bit silly but it was quite it was, I mean it was very important to have started from that point of view the other thing that we did in the scanner very early on was this study of theory of mind, which you know about probably. And again, we could show that there is a fairly circumscribed brain system that becomes active when you start thinking about other people's mental states or what other people are thinking. And I'm happy to say that these results have largely been replicated since then. And that was quite exciting because most of the studies relating brain and behaviour or brain and thinking have been done on patients with brain lesions. So cognitive like neuropsychology, which was very active before brain scanning came in, was all about trying to identify which bits of the brain were involved in various tasks like working memory or reading or um, location, space and all these sorts of things and that was quite well known and many of the early brain imaging studies were simply confirming that these studies had been correct and some of the more um, what would I say argumentative neuropsychologists like Max Coulthart would say that brain imaging hasn't told us anything that we didn't already know but in the case of theory of mind strangely enough no one had ever investigated this ability in people with brain lesions it was it was a, it was in a sense a newly described ability with newly developed tests. So in fact, it was studied with brain imaging before people started looking for it in people with brain injuries. So that was quite interesting. But I guess after when I retired, which is really where my career began, um, we became increasingly interested in what we call social cognition because both autism, which is what Uta studies, and schizophrenia, which is what I was studying, one of the major problems is interacting with other people. So we became very interested in how people interact with each other. And I had always been in... No, let's go back a bit. So one of the things I learned about at the Hammersmith and later at, in Queen Square from working with Carl Friston was this sort of Bayesian approach to brain and behaviour. So this is the idea, going back to Helmholtz, that when you see things, it's not a one-way process. It's not that there's a thing out there, it activates the retina, goes into the brain, there's a whole series of feed-forward processes and you eventually decide what it is. But in fact, if anything, it's the other way around. You have you decide what it is first, and then you collect the evidence from your senses to confirm whether you're right or not. And this is a so-called Bayesian approach. And it all depends. It's very statistical, but it depends on what we like to call precision. So that if you, you know, if you're in a fog, 
it's difficult to see things and therefore your precision of your sensory evidence is very low and therefore you depend on much more on what you expect to be there. So you're obviously, you're constantly tuning things by the precision of your bits of evidence. And there is a very beautiful experiment, not by me, asking what happens when you bring together two senses. In this case, it was vision and touch. So you could see a bar and you could feel the bar and you had to say, how wide was it? And because they were messing around with you, so it was a virtual bar, they could have a, have a discrepancy between what you felt and what you saw. But anyway, what we normally, vision is much more precise than touch. So it's what you perceive is dominated by the vision. But you can obviously add noise to the visual system. I mean, you can on the screen. So that the vision becomes less and less precise and then touch dominates. But the fascinating thing was that there's a sweet spot in between where there's a certain amount of noise in the vision and there's a usual amount of noise in the touch. And if you combine the two, you get a better estimate of how wide the bar is than you can with either one on its own. I'm sorry, this is going a very long way around. So, so what I was thinking about is what would happen if you had two people working together? And in this case, they would both be using vision. If they, if they, if they combine their evidence, so instead of combining two senses, you combine one sense and two people. Is there a sweet spot where you can get a better decision than either one working on their own? And very luckily, I persuaded my friend Bahadur Barame to actually do such an experiment, and he thought about how to do it properly. And it's a bit complicated, but basically, you have two people looking at the screen, and there's a very weak signal and they have to say was it in the first interval or the second interval and um, if they disagree they then have a discussion and have to come up with a joint decision and to our delight we found that indeed if you set the parameters right the joint decision is better than either one on their own and better than the best one on their own so that was very exciting. And then, of course, you would ask questions about how did, how is this possible? What happens in the discussion? And what you find is in the discussion, they're actually talking about how confident they are. So on each trial, if you choose the answer of the more confident person, you get a better result. And that's because obviously your attention is fluctuating all the time, but presumably not in parallel. So if one person says, I wasn't looking very well on that trial, you can you can pick out the better trial and that's why you get a better answer. So that led into a whole lot of thinking and experiments about social interactions and joint decision making. And I, so I think I'm probably most proud of that aspect of my career. It's interesting you say that your career, you felt it really began after you retired. <laughs> Do you mean just because you've had more time to, to really focus and work on exactly what you want? Yes, that's right. I mean, because you didn't have to apply for grants. I, and also, it wasn't really until we retired that Uta and I started working together and writing papers together. But the main reason, I think, was when I, when I say when I retired, when I left the Imaging Centre, in fact, I immediately, we immediately drove to Denmark, to Aarhus, where we joined something called the Interactive Minds Group, which is based on these sort of, and this is where the joint decision making study was done. And going back to my talk about how you need diversity and so on in that setup, we had even more diversity in the people who were working together because we had, we had psychologists, we had brain images, we had um, anthropologists, theologists, semioticians, political scientists, econom economists, and linguists so that, was, so that really broadens the mind and all sorts of strange things were done there are you still doing the uh, research for them i know you're a visiting professor at the university of Aarhus. yeah well we used we visited for the i mean for the five years we were there uh, only half six months a year or something like that so i guess you'd say it wasn't really retiring but at the end of that yes we used to go every year for a week or two, but of course that stopped because of the pandemic. 
but we hope to so we've missed it for three years or something like that but we're going we hope to go again in September this year as you mentioned a minute ago you've done some work with your wife Uta Frest who's obviously another very prominent psychologist what's it been like being married to someone you know in the, in the same field how, how do you think your career would have been different if you hadn't been well no I think it was very good because I mean the, the, an important factor is that we were always working on different topics and in different departments in, um, and that was very useful because from her I learned about autism which otherwise I would know nothing about which was very interesting because for example she was you know in this very first study that autistic people have this problem with theory of mind and um, thinking about that and how it related to schizophrenia came up with the idea that they also have theory of difficulty with theory of mind but in a sense it's the opposite way around so that the autistic person treats people as if they don't have mental states or doesn't think about their mental states whereas the paranoid person with schizophrenia is assigning all sorts of non-existent mental states to other people so in a sense it's almost as if it was overactive but in both cases not working properly so that was a I mean that was a novel idea that came from talking to Uta about this and I think um, she would benefit a bit from learning about Bayesian approaches and statistical approaches and things so there's a, I mean she hasn't worked particularly on this but there's certainly a current idea in autism that they put too much weight on their sensory priors and not enough on the high level ideas or something like that so pop so you can see how this is all beginning to fit together and certainly the social stuff we very much worked together on I mean I'm on the more mathematical side and she's more on the sort of understanding emotional side so that fits very nicely together throughout your relationship how much of the conversations that you have are occupied by you know your work and psychology do you do you talk about everything all of the time yes I think <laughs> yes I mean I think it says that in the book that our son has complained a bit about that's what we talked about at breakfast and we still do to some extent yeah well sure it's a good time to bring up this book actually because yeah you and your wife I believe earlier this year released yes yes that's this right. really wonderful book I really recommend everyone buys um, quite a unique book where you I suppose you talk about your your lives and careers and kind of key ideas in neuroscience and psychology in this lovely graphic novel form um, yeah what led to the idea to to create this book well um, we had always been interested in graphic novels mainly because our son Alex who's actually the main author of this book is keenly into graphic novels has written one of his own when he was younger and um, you know subscribed to 2000 AD long before 2000 AD um, <laughs> and I also read it secretly on the side um, and there's also a wonderful graphic novel which I know about called by someone called Franz Mazarel who was a Belgian artist and it's called My Passionate Journey at least in English and it has no words at all and it's all lino cuts but it's and that was in the 30s I think so so and of course Uta was brought up in these wonderful books by Wilhelm Busch who wrote little poems and had these cartoons particularly famous the ones about two very naughty boys called Max and Moritz who appear in there and I think when the, it sort of moved to America and became the Cats and Yammer Kids I mean if you know about the history of comics that's the sort of thing so there was that background but basically what happened was Uta and I were given the Jean Nico Prize which is from Paris from the École Normale Supérieure and you have to go and give four lectures and live in Paris for two weeks which is a terrible chore obviously and um, but strangely you only get the prize if you agree to write a book 
for MIT Press of the lectures. So we agreed to do that and every day we were walking from our flat to the École Normale Supérieure to give our lectures, one, you know, one every two days or something like that. And we happened to go through the Rue Dante in Paris, which is entirely full of shops selling graphic novels. And of course in France, graphic novels are much more important than they are in the UK. And you can get, you know, varying from Marvel-type comics to Proust as a graphic novel, so, and everything in between. And we thought, wouldn't it be much more interesting to write these lectures as a graphic novel? And we talked to our son, and to our delight, he was keen. And in fact, he is really the author of this book. We are just, we thought originally of ourselves as scriptwriters, but I'm not even sure of that. I think we're just characters in it. And he found this wonderful artist, Daniel Locke. But it's Alex who's responsible for putting our sort of life story into it. We were a bit worried about this, saying, you know, it's too egocentric. It can't be all about us. We appear on every page. And he said, no, that's fine. That's very common in graphic novels. And uh, it's fine as long as you appear in a bad light. So, so that's how that happened. And then he found, this, as I say, this wonderful artist, Daniel Locke, who finally decided it should be in full colour, so it took quite a long time to produce. And what I found fascinating is that it's much more like making a film. So Alex, if you like, is the director and who does the storyboard. Daniel Locke is the cameraman. And indeed, extra people had to come in who did the colouring in and made the speech bubbles and things. And then the more professional graphic novels, you have a list of contributors more like the end of a film. So that was very interesting. And the other thing I should have mentioned earlier, of course, the other thing that inspired us is this wonderful book called Logi Comics. Do you know that, which is, is it, I think I've, I've heard you speak about this. It's about Bertrand Russell. Yes, it's about Bertrand Sorry, Russell. Yeah. So it actually explains in comic strip format, you know, Girdle's proof and what Wittgenstein thought about the elephant in the room and so on. So if that if we thought if that can go into a comic novel, this is child's play. <laughs> Do you think that there should be more books like this? Uh, you know, books with with more photos, more accessible to people, because it seems actually a really powerful way to to get people to understand the brain in neuroscience. It doesn't actually dumb it down. It seems to you know make it clear to have all these beautiful photos and stuff. Well, that's right. I mean, when when we were thinking about doing this graphic novel, it seemed strange to us that there isn't more like this because of course if we give a talk if there would be innumerable slides with pictures on and pictures and particularly doing brain imaging pictures is the best way colored pictures in particular is the best way to show the data whereas if you write an academic book if they allow you color at all it'll be put into the middle not next to the pages where it's actually talked about and otherwise, you may, if you're lucky, get a few black and white pictures. So it seems weird that when we give talks, it's absolutely full of illustrations of one kind or another. So a graphic, no a graphic approach seemed much nearer to the way we would like to present our stuff. But if I can moan for a moment, one of the problems, we, so as you say, we this book came out in March, and it's got a very nice review as a graphic novel in The Guardian. But it doesn't, the bookshops don't know where to put it. And as you rightly say, we think of it as a popular science book, but it doesn't get into the popular science section and doesn't get reviewed as a popular science book. So I'm hoping that somebody eventually will realise that this is what it is. <laughs> yeah, so, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's a shame it's not in the popular science section. Where, where's it placed then? Different if you're lucky, it's put in the graphic novel section. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the other thing is that a lot of people think it must be for children. And so somebody will come up to me and say, I bought it for my eight-year-old, but actually I find it quite interesting too. <laughs> so kind of just back to, your, back to your career a little bit more generally, were there any things you weren't able to work on which you wish you had been able to, any questions that kind of have been unexplored that maybe you'll get to at one point, but you at least haven't thought about so far? 
Well, I suppose, yes. I mean, one of the things we did in Denmark, another aspect of the interacting people, was an int- a very simple task where the two people had to tap in synchrony. And they you know, they can be in different rooms and you can do fancy things like you can hear the other person but not yourself and so on and so on. But what you find is that people are very good at tapping in synchrony and they but you have this interesting because this becomes very mathematical, um they they can never get it quite right. So if you're if you're earlier than the other on the previous trial, you're going to slow down, but the other person of course is later than you, so they're going to speed up. So you have this interesting constant shift but they're constantly adapting to each other that's the main point of it you do it by adapting to each other on this millisecond basis but you can also show that you can get a leader follower situations because you this very simple task has two components you have to keep the beat you know the speed that's been set by the experiment and you have to keep synchronized so in certain situations it, it gets automatically divided so one person is keeping the beat and the other person is doing the synchronizing which means of course that the synchronizing person is being is more adaptive than the person who's keeping the beat and you can measure this very accurately and that actually interesting that goes right back to the beginning because you can do this with a string quartet i haven't done this but a colleague of mine worked on this where you look at inter note interval and you can show that in most string quartets the leader is actually the leader and the rest of them have to adapt to him or her and you can demonstrate this is the case and what would be very interesting to do is to tr- apply the same technique to people with autism or schizophrenia because one would assume that they would have difficulty in doing this adapting so that's one experiment that area that one would like to do and likewise with the making joint decisions would it not work in the, some of these situations where it's difficult to interact with other people so those areas which if I had not retired I mean Richard, when I was younger I probably would have followed up properly the other thing that's always interested me is um, consciousness which and how it comes out of a brain and there's more and more work on this and there are various competing theories which are actually explaining different things in my opinion so there's lots of exciting work that could be done there because I believe that at least the highest level of consciousness is actually all about social interaction because again you have this interesting it's a bit like the brain imaging you have this interesting situation I can't tell you anything about my conscious process but I can tell you about my conscious my unconscious process but I can tell you about my conscious processes and although you often think of my conscious experience as something deeply private which you can't share we can actually share because I can tell you about it and you can even get interesting overlapping I mean what's the word in, in, the other area I would love to work on is whether by doing this sort of sharing you can actually change somebody's conscious experience. So the example I always give is in wine tasting, where if you go to a wine tasting class or something, this leader will you know, smell the wine and taste it and say, oh yes, definitely gooseberries. And then you all experience the gooseberry smell from the... <laughs> so is that really happening? Have you Has your qualia as the philosophers call it actually changed that would be that's another area i would like to think how much do you think uh philosophers contribute and can contribute to the debate about consciousness as opposed to you know more empirical scientists no i think they can a lot i mean i when i retired from denmark (laughs) i then moved i now have a desk in the institute of philosophy in University of London and I mean there obviously there are all sorts of different philosophers but the philosophers I talk to are extremely interested in empirical work and brain imaging and brain science generally and can make enormous contributions because they point out the flaws in your argument what's wrong with your concepts and why the experiments don't tell you what you think they tell you 
and certainly my many of my recent papers on things like consciousness have been in collaboration with Nick Shea, who's one of the philosophers there. So I think they can contribute a great deal. What do you think is currently the best explanation or theory of consciousness? Probably the global workspace theory, um, which is interesting because it's the idea that the basic idea is you have all these separate systems in the brain, like vision and touch, which we talked about a bit before about how you combine them, but working memory, I mean, memory and ideas and so on, and they all have to be brought together. And the idea is that the global workspace is evidence or information from all these different subsystems is brought together and they actually would use the word, it is broadcast so that you can fit them together in an optimal way to make the right decision about what to do next. And I, I think there's a great deal of mileage in this and it sort of fits with the way that the brain works. It involves particularly the frontal cortex, which is where a lot of this stuff has to be brought together. But of course, I like it because it uses the word broadcast. And I'm saying, well, yes, not only it can be broadcast within the person, but it can be broadcast to other people as well. Um, but the big argument, the big, the, which gets quite heated, is whether consciousness involves the frontal cortex or only the back of the brain. And there are heated arguments about this at the moment. Obviously, I'm in favour of the frontal cortex end of things. I also believe that actually there are two levels of consciousness which you might call sentience, which is being aware of blue, say, and consciousness proper or meta-consciousness, which is where I know that I'm being aware of blue and I can think about what sort of a blue it is. And there's another one of the other competing theories is so-called higher-order thought theory, which says consciousness emerges when you... I mean, there's a very philosophical thing where you have a representation of, where you think about your representations, which is a higher order thought. What I suspect relates to this meta-consciousness, but not to sentience, which might eventually bring a sort of um, rapprochement between these various theories, but that remains to be seen. And I have no idea how you study sentience, because as with humans, at least, as soon as you ask people about what they're being aware of, they're obviously moving into this meta-conscious fra frame. Where do you think scientists and philosophers will be in, you know, 10, 20 years on consciousness? <laughs> well, probably they won't have any money anymore, yeah. Um, yes, I'm not very optimistic. Yes, if, if everything goes well, I'm sure that many of the easier aspects of consciousness will have been resolved. I mean, there's an interesting parallel. I think there's an interesting parallel between consciousness and life. So life used to be thought to be an impossible thing that could not be solved. And it now has been solved and people really don't talk about it very much. I mean, you have DNA sequences and you have, <clears throat> we know how all that works and how transmission occurs and so on and so on. And in fact, it's become a sort of non-problem that people don't talk about. And in fact, in those early days, there was really no distinction between life and consciousness. So in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the monster is not just given life, but is given exquisitely um, advanced consciousness. I mean, completely different from the film versions. And now this is sort of separated off. So most of us at least think that Consciousness is associated with only higher life forms. And one wonders if the same thing will happen, that as various aspects of consciousness are resolved, it ceases to be interesting, but there will always be something left for the philosophers to worry about. And there's a very interesting parallel with psychiatry, because in the, last, no, in the end of the 19th century, the thing... Psychiatry was interested in epilepsy. Epilepsy was part of psychiatry. Tertiary syphilis was part of psychiatry. And no doubt some other things that I've forgotten. And then both of these things were solved. So epilepsy was, you know, the mechanisms in the brain were discovered. 
tertiary syphilis was solved and then the complete mechanism and the spirochete or whatever it was was discovered and you could cure it. And of course, so they ceased to be psychiatry and became neurology. So I think the same is likely to happen with schizophrenia. When we discover what the cause of schizophrenia or some types of schizophrenia is, it will cease to be psychiatry and become neurology. So psychiatrists have this very hard problem that their, their subject is always going to be mysterious because when it ceases to be mysterious, it's taken away from them. Now that you're retired, how do you spend your, your huh. days and your weeks? <laughs> well, until recently, until about a month ago, we were still trying to write our MIT book <laughs> for the Jean Nicot lectures only six years later, whatever it was. But that's now been finally submitted and accepted. So, but we still spend a certain amount of time writing. There are still a few papers to write. That's, so that's basically... And, just, and you're a big reader, so you still consume all the latest papers and... Yes, well, I, yes, I mean, that's, it's interesting. I, it's very difficult to keep up because more and more stuff is published. So there are a few journals that I follow. But in fact, one of the best places for finding out what's going on is Twitter. At least the people I follow in Twitter are telling me what the new interesting papers are. And also, it's very good for telling you what the new interesting papers are, which are actually not to be believed. So, <laughs> you and Uta have lived in London for about 30 yeah, years, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Is it just the work that's kept you here, or do you, do you love the city and where you live as well? Uh, it's, that's a good point. Um, we basically, it's basically the work, because we've always had jobs. I mean, we moved out to Harrow because I got this with the MRC. I was working at Northwick Park Hospital, which is just down at the bottom of the hill. So it was slightly annoying when they closed it down and I had to go to Hammersmith and then to Queen Square. But we do like London. Of course, we lived in Aarhus for periods of six months and that's a wonderful place. It's Denmark's second biggest city. You can drive from one side to the other in the rush hour in about 20 minutes. <laughs> you can walk to the seaside in two different directions. Um... And it's wonderful, but eventually it's a bit quiet, so it's nice to come back to London. We're in your office at the moment, in your in your house. There's a lovely bookcase behind us filled with many, many books. If you had to point to maybe, you know, two or three of your favourites, could you think of any? Well, I have a hand library, as the Germans call it, over there. Um, so my f I was very much influenced by Borges, if that's how you pronounce him, mm. because he, that, was, I was, that was when I was young. And he wrote a couple of stories which are very relevant to neuroscience. So there's one that people quote quite a lot called, was it? I can't remember what it's called, it's about the triumph of geography where in this little country the geographers become so important they get enough money to, to, to make a map that is the same size as the country and coincides with it at every point. <laughs> and he points out that this is completely useless. <laughs> and there are some models of how the brain works which are a bit like this. But the other story is called Funes the Memorius, which is about a young man who has a brain injury as a result of which he has a perfect memory, episodic memory, so he can remember you know, everything that's happened. He can remember the dog at 12 o'clock and the same dog at 12.15 and so on. And the consequence of that is that he ceases to categorise things because they're all separate, which of course is a disaster. So I mean, that's a very interesting idea that taken up in neuroscience and cognition particularly, that all these bottlenecks are actually a jolly good thing. The fact that we can't remember forces us to categorise the world into simple categories, which actually helps you to understand how the world works. The other writer, which I mentioned before, of course, is Philip K. Dick, science fiction writer, but his, his constant theme was that reality is not what it seems. There's something hidden behind it. So he's one of his best... He's very good at titles, so he there's a famous one... Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which became Blade Runner. But the one I like is called The Penultimate Truth. 
And that's really a description of what science is all about, which I think people don't understand. But we don't know the truth. We're always finding an approximation and we hope and we're looking for better ones. Does it feel does it feel nice that, you know, you've become you're such a pioneer in the field and I've been a role model to so many students? Yeah, yes, I mean that does feel good and I'm very pleased with the various people I've tutored and so on over time and that we still get on well together. But I guess I think about what I think about myself is probably going to be untrue. I'm still I'm much more interested in what's going to be found next. And I certainly when I'm meeting people I want to talk about their newest research and all that sort of stuff. And I have no interest whatever in politics and administration and those sorts of things, which is probably a bad thing because if you're not interested in politics it steadily gets worse. <laughs> well Chris, thanks so much for all the work you've done and for taking the time to speak speak to me today and having me over here to your to your lovely house. I really appreciate Great. it. Good, thanks. No, I enjoyed that chat. I mean, part of this all is to discover what my narrative is. <laughs> so I may know a bit more about myself after this chat. <laughs> I hope you do. Thanks a lot, Chris. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you enjoyed the Human Podcast, please consider subscribing. I hope to see you soon.